Dr. Tusha is with us is with us today from um, Kuala Lumpur. Lost one of my ears here. Thank you so much for coming today, Tusha, to talk to us about the value of visual images in teaching English. Welcome, Tusha. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me here. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening depending on which part of the world you are, it's my pleasure to uh, present today in the Career Path Development uh, webinar series uh, organized by uh, TESOL uh, International. Um, thank you once again for the opportunity. I will pull up my slides. Okay, could you all see the slides? Yes. Yeah, you, you want to change it to view yes, the slideshow. Yes, yeah, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, once again, um, my presentation today is entitled A Picture Paints a Thousand Words. And um, this uh, subject is very close to my to my heart simply because it was part of my uh, PhD studies. Uh, I actually looked into how pictures and words uh amalgamate to create meanings, yeah. So from then on, I just went on to look into other visual elements. Over here, you have the picture of Lat, uh, uh, Mama actually. Lat is one of our prolific cartoonists from Malaysia. Yes. Okay, just a bit of uh, introduction about myself. Uh, I'm affiliated with the Teacher Education Institute, Malay Language Campus, uh, based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Malaysia itself has 27 teaching uh, education institutes, uh, plus uh, the English language teaching center. And we actually train teachers for uh, both uh, primary and sometimes also to uh, sec for secondary schools. Um, I'm currently the senior lecturer there, and I'm also the head of the English language unit. My research interests include TESOL, semiotics, multimodality, popular culture, best practices, and creative pedagogies. Okay, so the key takeaways from uh, my presentation today is actually looking into how multimodal and visual literacy could be uh, used in the classroom. Why is there the need to use images, ways of using images, and uh, finally, my of conclusion. Okay. So this is the outline. We would first looked into uh, multimodality and visual literacies. Then we move on to using a model of dissection, which I actually came up with, uh, the basic model. Then we will also go into strategies used in the classroom and finally how we put them all together. So yes, we talk about uh, literacies, the different types of literacies. When we talk about uh, multi-literacies, multi-literacies is something still, uh, still uh, it has been there. The word itself was coined by uh, the New England group in, in 2009. And uh, one of the important elements of multi-literacy is multi-model literacy. And um, multimodality itself uh, involves uh, a few elements which include uh, visual, um, spatial, um, gestural, linguistic, textual, the different modes which bring on to multimodality and how important it is to actually use these uh, modes to, uh, to teach our students. And, uh, Multimodality also includes visual, so I would be actually looking into visual literacy. So uh, for today's presentation, I would be looking into different strategies, but because of the short period of time, I would be looking at art, artworks, uh, graphic novels, which are close to my heart, and also uh, picture books, which are used with children and uh, children in uh, early primary uh, stages. Why is why is uh, it, uh, is it important to be visually literate? It's important to understand pictures and how they affect us 
as it is to be word literate. Many of us employ visual language often without realizing it. Being fluent in the language of image gives us an advantage at school, at work, and at home. So here, it is very important that we actually look into uh, images because there are just so many layers of meanings in an image. Um, usually, the practice is just giving an image and looking into it. But with a proper structure, so to say, you would be able to explore what's beyond. And that is already um, encouraging uh, critical and creative thinking. Um, this was, uh, is quoted by uh, Brian Kennedy, and he's currently the director of the museum, uh, the Toledo Museum of Art in the United States. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, earlier on for the clarification of Toledo in the United States. Okay. And a team of neuroscientists from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has found that the human brain can process entire images that the eyes sees for as little as 30 milliseconds. The first evidence of such rapid processing speed. And this shows, you know, if it's such minute time range, how, how quickly our brains uh, process images. So we look into textual literacy, which is, which is common. And in the new norm, we also look into digital literacy because practically every one of us are, you know, uh, are into online teaching these days. And uh, we, are, we are forever upgrading ourselves and upskilling ourselves with various digi digital elements. And this is also uh, true for our own students. Um, but it's also, uh, important that we look into sensory literacy and uh, you know like Liz and I was talking earlier before the start of the session that uh, the uh, you know the norm that we are so uh, that we are right in currently you know teaching online sessions we are so uh, into images also even this session today is uh, is, is multi-modality um, so it's important to, to also uh, incorporate sensory literacy where visual literacy is the uh, key to sensory literacy. Okay, so we talk about visual literacy. Why is it so important? Uh, the first thing is multimodality and I've already uh, touched on multimodality, the importance of the different modes. Uh, Multimodality itself is, is, uh, is quite easily achievable with the different modes of uh, things that we have around us. Multidisciplinary, visual literacy is multidisciplinary. You could just jump from one um, uh, discipline to another discipline by just using, for example, if you are using an image of um, um, space, in your classroom. So from the language itself, you're also going into the scientific dis disciplinary, asking the students to actually look into, let's say, a picture of uh, the universe. And then if you want them to come up with a poem on that, that would be your language part. But beyond that, they are also learning something about science. So yeah, that's where multidisciplinary comes in. Mm -hmm. And interdisciplinary, within, within visual literacy itself, interdisciplinary, the, the, um, the various branches of knowledge that is available within that discipline itself. Um, and finally, collaborative, you know, it, it, it's fantastic to see how uh, visual literacy encourages collaboration uh, between uh, our students actually when you put them uh, in, in, their, in their groups and currently now when we put them in their breakout rooms actually in the new norm we put them in their breakout rooms. Okay, the, moving on, the benefits of adopting images. Um, you know, the first thing, of course, supporting multiple intelligences, Howard Gardner's theory of multiple in, uh, intelligences. It's so apt when you use uh, images, the promotion of visual literacy. And uh, something which is very important is the, sub, the support of different theories of cognition. One of the earliest theory of cognition, which supports, uh, you know, the 
the adoption of images is uh, Alien uh, Pavio's dual coding, uh, where he talks about uh, the importance of uh, you know uh, using both sides of our cognitive functions, which are actually divided into language and images. And then you also have uh, Mayer, who talks about multimedia learning, where students learn uh, effectively both by adopting words and images more than words alone. So, you know, these are some of the theories of uh, cognition which supports the benefits uh, of adopting images. And then moving on to helping reluctant and struggling students, there, there is a, a, a range of scholarship on, on, you know, how effective images are in helping reluctant and struggling students. Uh, for instance, using graphic novels in the classroom. Um, you know, uh, if we are talking about the, the literature subject by itself, in, uh, graphic novels can be an introduction. Like, uh, for example, uh, if you have the text that they have to read, uh, Khalid Hussein's uh, The Kite Runner, there is actually a beautiful interpretation through a graphic novel of the same uh, uh, novel of Khalid Hussini. And you also have uh, Marvel coming up with uh, Pride and Prejudice, for example, in the graphic form. So there, there is a range of materials, especially uh, in this case, graphic novels that could be used as supplementary materials before introducing students to the actual text. Again, supplementary because you know those who are very much the purists of literary would sometimes you know oh no I'm not going to you know uh, introduce uh, graphic novels yeah some find them fluff but you know graphic novels are something close to my heart and I, I and I really you know believe that they make excellent supplementary materials promote autonomous uh, learning and this is where we give our um, students the uh, chance to, to actually uh, be uh, independent, give them something, ask them to explore, ask them to exploit. And it, it's, it's wonderful how uh, they interpret and they are able to produce different items altogether. And addressing significant and current issues, images are all around us. You open up the newspaper, pick out a picture, and you are actually talking about a current issue. Uh, you go back in time and take a painting and you are talking about something in the past, which is very relevant to a history lesson, so to say. So it is not only in languages, but you know, different kinds of uh, subjects could use um, uh, images uh, effectively. And so, 90% of what we take is taken in visually. And, and you know, you look all around you, your yeah, images are all around us. The visual is learned before the verbal. And for those of us who, who you know, who have children and, and, and you know, who, 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 who teach children know that, you know, from babies, we expose them to books with images. And, and that shows how important visual is. And it is important to reintegrate the senses. Um, they present incredible opportunities for focused language work, skill-based activities, interactivity, discussion, um, and they promote higher order thinking skills, which is something very in in Malaysia right now, critical thinking skills and um, creative thinking skills. And at the end of the day, here today, engagement is so pertinent, especially in this new norm. We have our students behind those screens. So how are we going to make them engaged in our lessons? So we, we could use visuals in our classrooms. So yeah, this is, this is just a short test. You could put the answers in the chat box. Uh, this was adapted from Brown. Um, yeah, what do you see? You have to come up with, you know, maybe a phrase or a word. This is actually a visual literacy test. The first image, the second image with Pepsi, and the third. Okay, so the first one is actually eggplant. Yay, <laughs> got it correct. And the second one is actually um, the king of pop. 
okay uh because you know can's pop so that is the king of pop and the third one is ipod so yeah so yes this is this is you know they have lots of these kind of visual tests over the uh, internet so you could just uh, google and see so this is actually a very fun uh, vocab phrase learning activities that we could actually use with our our students in the classroom okay so the process of looking at, uh, at art uh, uh, so uh, brian kennedy uh, you know, he came up with this uh, six descriptors. Uh, so you look, you observe, you see, you describe, you analyze, you interpret. I'm just looking at the slide, the word act is missing there, the process of looking at art, yeah? So I have actually uh, included that for image. So you could use the same thing. What you do when you look, what do you do when you observe, you see, you mm -hmm. describe, you analyze, and you interpret. And if you look at the last three um, steps, it is actually at a higher level of the Bloom's taxonomy. And uh, this shows that with different students, actually, with different ability of students, we could actually phase them out at which level that we would want to be. Like if the student is, is less proficient, the interpretation part would be difficult, but um, uh, you know, with proper, I always believe with proper guidance and scaffolding, uh, they would be able to reach there. Okay, so the model itself, this model was, uh, you know, it's it's uh, actually created, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I concorded it in, in 2015, and then in 2019, I added the, the let us see because it came on to creating. So initially it started out as the base model, uh, which is uh, heavily grounded in uh, social semiotics and multimodality is part of social semiotics. And uh, the theory uh, behind this is uh, visual grammar, which is propounded by Gunter Kress and Theo uh, Van Leeuwen in their um, book, uh, Reading Images. There is already a 2020 edition. Um, so to me, there is an importance of having a structured and systematic approach to analyze images. And uh, coming from a linguistics background, I, I realized that uh, not many would actually look beyond. That is what I, 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 I I'm re-emphasizing the importance of layering in images because most people tend to just give the pictures and what can you do with those pictures? But there is a need to actually analyze what's beyond. And one of the things that you could do is to look at what kind of background that picture provides. Um, what is salient in that particular picture or image? And what kind of shot is, is, is uh, used in that particular pictures because these elements actually bring layers of meanings. So uh, back to multimodality is actually creating meanings through the different modes. Uh, and in creation, which I added in 2019, they could come up with their own poem based on that particular picture, skits, artworks, uh, etc. So this is how it works. So if you look at this uh, image, which I actually took from one of my favorite children's uh, picture book, Gorilla by uh, Anthony Brown, uh, you could, uh, the background here could be detailed, minimal or sans. There, are, uh, uh, there is no background at all. But in this instance, it is a very uh, detailed background. So you could see, uh, you know, the cabinet, there's a flask there, there's a fridge and, um, oops, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then we look at the, sh we look at the shot. What kind of shot it is? Is it a long shot? Okay. Long shots usually uh, are used for uh, picturesque scenes, you know, where you could see a lot of things. Okay. Medium shot, this is a medium shot and a close shot is a close up. So why do, why do this image is presented in such ways? And then the salience of it. Here in this particular image, what is so salient here? And salience is determined by size, contrast, 
sharpness, position, colors. And in this uh, particular image, what is the most salient here is, of course, the father, the father there reading the newspaper. And uh, for those who, who are familiar with a uh, gorilla, you would know that the gorilla actually represents the father. Whenever Hannah sees the father, it's like she's seeing the gorilla. <laughs> and the theme of loneliness is so well uh, you know, used in that particular picture book. And these, uh, these are some of the uh, images that I've used in my classrooms, which are easily available. The first one, you know, uh, uh, it, it is the, using this famous scene from Titanic, but here it is actually a uh, broadband, you know, uh, Bona broadband. And this actually, um, with my students, it actually uh, led to pretty interesting discussions. And we move on to the next image of a chameleon, but this chameleon has two heads. So it actually, it's a double-sided chameleon, goes on to scotch tape, which is actually double-sided. And, um, here is a typical for Liz uh, and Linda who have been to Malaysia. I'm sure you have eaten uh, Chinese Peranakan food. And this is an array of a beautiful uh, layout of uh, Peranakan food. And this actually also, uh, when I got them into discussion, we actually looked at cultural elements in Malaysia itself. So moving internally in Malaysia and then externally, it brings uh, cross-cultural discussions uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to, to others to understand how it works. And here, I think uh, this is one of the paintings that I use uh, frequently in my classroom, Edward Munch, The Screen. And uh, it's interesting how students interpret it because, you know, uh, it, it, different students look at it differently. You know, some say, you know, he was probably looking at, uh, you know, something, uh, horrendous in front of them. Uh, but then some also look at the skyline and, and it's again, how you interpret it, the background of that image. Um, what is the most salient in that particular image? Yeah, so these are some of the examples that I used in my classroom. So yes, uh, so like I mentioned earlier, we would be looking into art, graphic novels and picture books. So the first strategy is using art, which is not very common uh, among many, but I find art pieces are rich in uh, information. Um, you know, the pictures aren't just pictures, they are the tone, the wit, the style, the plot, the people, all in one. And these, again, are some of the images that I've used in my classroom. So why use art? It has the potential to develop students' creative and critical thinking. It leads on to a great variety of activity. It can increase students' proficiency levels and in increases enjoyment. Um, there were times that I have asked my students to draw something, but not during our language class, but do it as a take-home uh, take home activity and come back uh, during the following class and share it with the others. So it becomes a, a share and tell kind of lesson. And it's, uh, it's amazing how even students who are less proficient make an effort to actually come up with some kind of drawing to share with their friends. And uh, I actually look uh, at that as a success itself because getting them out of their shells to mm. talk to some uh, about something which is close to their hearts is an achievement by itself. And my own interest this semester, when I was asked to teach language arts, and one of the genres uh, that was uh, in that particular syllabus is poetry. And I was like thinking, okay, how am I going to teach poetry to this uh, L2 learners who have no background, you know, in any way with English language uh, poetry, except of with what they have learned in school and asking them to come. But later on, you would see uh, how I went about doing that. So language anxiety is influenced by cognitive challenges and, and L2 uh, students, uh, many of them have language anxiety. Uh, so there is the need to explore multimodality in the classroom. And I will show you how English poetry writing can be, uh, 
can be um, you know can be something that is enjoyable rather than challenging for for students so what i did was you know the poetry selected was uh, uh, the genre sorry selected uh, was poetry again i used back my model to analyze and uh, for this semester, I used uh, the paintings from Vincent van Gogh, Malaysian Tan Gek Hoon, and uh, Frida Kahlo. These painting images are all available on the internet. Um, and some, if you go to uh, um, MoMA's website, you could al also use some of their images for classroom purposes. I think a lot of museums now allow their images to be used for classroom purposes. Um, this is the painting, Strolling. And I looked into, uh, before I, I asked them to come up with their own interpretation, I actually uh, scaffolded the lesson by explaining what is the background, you know, what could be, what is the most salient uh, element here? You know, what kind of shot is this? This is, uh, this is of course, a medium shot. And this is one example by my student, Hazik. Um, you know, he came in uh, being very apprehensive about his language uh, uh, proficiency. And uh, I was very impressed when he came up with this particular poem. She's a woman, not a girl, not a child. She's a woman, can be good, can be bad. They think she's weak, but only she knows what she's capable of. She's a woman, comes a day when she's a wife. A loving heart, no one can compare. The heart of a thousand mothers. She's a woman, protect her, love her endlessly. And the simplicity of the words. I, I tell them, you know, get rid of all your inhibitions. Use words that you're comfortable with. But I was impressed that just by looking with that image, wow. you just come up with that, yeah. And the words, they are just simple. They are not some big bombastic words that you would expect you know, when you actually analyze poetry, for example. Um, this is another uh, image that I used, a cherished moment also by the same artist. Um, and this was done by one of my other students who was a bit more uh, comfortable with coming up with the haiku because there's not much of language uh, per se involved uh, in writing it short. And, and it's interesting, you just have to worry about, you know, line one, five syllables, line two, seven syllables, and line three, again, five syllables. It, I mean, I was also, uh, you know, pretty impressed with her. So pretty in red, my mother, the queen of hearts, pure inside and out. And it fits in perfectly to the construction of a haiku. Um, and then uh, this is another uh, this is another image uh, Vincent Van Gogh's very popular Starry Night, and uh, another student of mine came up with this poem. And uh, here you could see the you know the words like nights, um, you know sky, and these are all important elements in that uh, particular image. Okay, this was a rather uh, complicated uh, interpre uh, interpretation, but she did it so well. Uh, Chan is, is uh, from a, a Chinese medium school, and now she's with us to teach uh, uh, the Malay language in future for primary school children. And uh, I was pretty impressed again with her ability of course she had a, a little minor errors initially but uh, like i said earlier the act of uh you know error analysis they come to you and you just correct them from time to time but you know uh, 99 percent of this was from her own uh handwriting from her own thoughts um we just would quickly look into how she did. i'm sorry good day i did so, uh my name is Chan An Wen. I'm from IBG Campus West Malayu. My poetry for today is an original composition entitled Starry Night, inspired by Vincent Van Gogh's painting, also entitled Starry Night. Blue lens round the yellow, dominating the painting. Yellow 
mix well with white, shunung moon and stars. Brown suits it gray, as shown the little villages at the base. Each part stands out harmonious and peaceful. Yet, they come together at a glorious image. The sky is a divine, far the most dream light, as you and trees soar up the sky, bringing the message of the God to the village. Each brush strokes so much of precision with so much of consideration. Just like life, even to darkness, stars gives hope. How I say, I feel the passions of the painter, the art of his love, a magic piece of beating hearts, the great work of Winston Bank. That's all for me today. Thank you. So yeah, this is her rendition of her own composition. And um, uh, I, you know, uh, she, she came in very uh, shy and for her to present this uh, was an achievement itself. She has actually uploaded this on YouTube. Okay, so we go on to the second strategy, graphic novels. Um, the fact that they are multi-model, meaning multiple modes of expressions are used, facilitates and supports students' ability to visualize and understand complicated ideas, which is also a 21st century literacy skill. So here, uh, I have used Mat Song uh, with my students because it's close to Malaysian uh, uh, multiculturalism. Um, so why graphic novels? They stimulate a creative imagination. They develop an increased interest in reading. They develop language skills and a rich and varied vocabulary. They foster interest in a variety of literary genres. So getting them to read graphic novels, you could actually see them moving on to different types of genres, biographies, uh, Memoirs. These are just some of the genres that you could actually get your students interested in by first introducing them to graphic novels. Uh, they increase understanding of how meanings are found within the visual context. And finally, they enhance understanding of popular culture and other media. So one of the most important things in order to use graphic novels uh, in the classroom is to understand what are the elements of a graphic novel. So it's, it's pertinent for um, teachers actually to tell their students, you know, what's the function of a speech balloon bubble? Why, why is it, you know, some panels does not contain bubbles at all because there is a reason to it. Um, your panel frame, you have some uh, frames uh, bleeding into the other one. And that is basically because that particular event, usually it's a very important event in that particular plot. Uh, gutter, the space between the panels are known as gutter. And then, uh, you know, uh, what are the camera angles? Again, we go on to whether it's a long shot, closer. So these terminologies, if you want to use graphic novels effectively in the classroom, should be taught. So this is, this is the structure that I'm talking about, that they know these terminologies in order to, to um, uh, decipher the novels better. 
and uh, you could easily use uh, graphic novels, for example, to teach themes. Um, so in my class, uh, we actually looked into the exploration of themes and using the same model, and we looked into the panel of large smart song. So if you look at this particular uh, panel, uh, this is actually a single page panel. Um, and this one has two panels. So going back to this, the most uh, evident theme here is diversity. Uh, you have this big canvas here, which is uh, used as a cover for this stall. And it's actually a Hindi movie uh, named Hamras, which was very popular in the early uh, 1970s. And you have uh, uh, this uh, Indian uh, stall owner. And uh, yes, and uh, you have them enjoying soup. Ayam is uh, chicken and kambing is uh, goat. So chicken soup. And these are all uh, the various uh, facets of, uh, you know, uh, multiculturalism in Malaysia. And here you have... Uh, this typical Chinese lady in her, her Cheong Sam. Uh, sorry, this is not Cheong Sam, this is Sam Fu, the pan, the, the blouse and the and the trousers and the trousers. And uh, this is a, a very old um, ice scraping machine. I don't know whether you have seen this before, but this this uh, this is uh, very popular in Malaysia those days. Nowadays we hardly use this kind of machine. And uh, again, uh, what, what, what are the elements here? Multiculturalism, diversity. So these are some of the themes that we explored in this particular panel. So having said that, rather than asking them just to read, by just analyzing the pictures, they could actually come up with what are the themes which are so relevant in these panels. And uh, finally, we go on to our last uh, strategy using picture books. Um, the illustration in picture books are the first paintings most children see. And because of that, they are incredibly important. What we see and share at that age stays with us for life, um, which is actually very profound because as, as a child, I remember uh, my mother actually did not sit with me to read, but she just, you know, uh, when we were growing up, we were just given books. Um, but over time, this was like how many years ago, uh, 50 years ago, you know, over time we progress and uh, we teach children how to actually look into the images and, and actually, um, you know, go on to the meanings of those images. So why picture books? There is a symbiotic relationship between text and images. Uh, interventions that train parents to share picture books with children and this strategy for supporting child language development. Uh, the benefits of using text and image related materials are multiple. And you know, there are just tons of uh, research supporting the notion of why picture books are such important elements in the classroom. So here, uh, the, I used a picture book, but here I, I did this activity actually differently because I did, I did not uh, deal with uh, preschoolers, but I had one cohort of uh, teacher trainees who actually had to go into a preschool to, 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 to do their practical. So I introduced them to the model and I asked them to use it to elicit uh, different words to enrich vocabulary. And these were my trainees in action. Uh, this was taken about uh, three years ago. Uh, how to use those pictures. So they started with showing the pictures rather than reading aloud. They, while reading aloud, they were actually looking into what was the background, what was the shot, what was the salient. So that was already a structure in the trainees' uh, heads. This is how we should, you know, go about this picture book rather than just reading it like that and asking the children 
to come up with some words related to the images that they saw. So, you know, when, when, when you show picture books to children, they would actually pick out what are the most distinct images that they see. But beyond that, if you look at, you know, even in a long shot, if there is a, uh, there is a picture of a sky, if you start from the beginning and you show them, uh, the probability of them having uh, eliciting more words is incredible. And uh, these are the children in action while they were doing it. So we actually did a pre and post before actually using the model and after. And after the, the intervention, they actually had more words because they were able to actually see, uh, you know, what's in the background rather than just picking up like two characters or three characters. Uh, we, for this particular class, we used uh, the book, uh, The King and the Pauper. So yeah, those are the three strategies that, uh, that you know, that uh, I discussed today, but there are also other forms, like I was telling earlier on uh, to, to, to the members uh, of the webinar before we went on. Uh, I'm just looking at stills today, but you, you know, moving images are another uh, ball game altogether because you could use it fantastically. So other forms, uh, this is a, a movie poster. You can even use a book cover. Um, this is a movie poster of La Misra. And uh, this is a, a print advertisement printed many, many years ago for uh, Volvo and, and, and the Beatles. And here, cartoon strips. Uh, we use cartoon strips uh, quite regularly in the classroom. But let's look into the images of it. If you want to ask them to come up with a short passage, Let's look into what is in the picture itself rather than just looking at, you know, the words here. Uh, you know, uh, what actually goes on beyond the dialogue, okay, uh, between these two characters. You could also use col uh, collages in your classroom. Mm. This is a collage of the Af Afghan girl. And uh, I know for sure uh, that this is actually also a, a cover page of National Geographic way back in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, newspaper uh, pictures. This is a Pulitzer winning uh, picture a couple of years ago, which actually uh, uh, the uh, photographer actually explained it as famine in uh, Yemen. And you could also use memes, which are very popular with our students. But how are you going to go beyond the memes? How do you use memes effective, uh, effectively in the classroom? And this is, of course, a photograph. You could always, we have tons of photos. The students have tons of photos in their cameras. So bring them all in, into the classroom. Ask them to look beyond what they have snapped and they will be able to come with, with different kind of interpretation. So we look, we move on from seeing and then we go on to interpretation and you know coming up with their own creation. So different levels of students, different uh, levels of proficiency, uh, you know, they would be able to be at different categories of that, that six categories. A few considerations, the importance of considering pedagogical goals. Um, you know, here you could actually look into what is your end goal and then you work backwards. This is where backwards design comes in. Mm -hmm. With the end in mind, you break it down and then, you know, you start, you know, what do you want to achieve? The need to sequence and scaffold, rather than just throwing the image to them, there is a need for you to sequence and scaffold. And interpretations must be logical and based on evidence. And we um, shouldn't bring our own assumptions into the classroom because if these students have fantastic uh, analysis based on logic or even their own understanding, they are perfectly okay. Like, you know, for example, white in different cultures, the color white or even red brings different uh, connotations. Red uh, can denote anger, but in some culture, you know, it, it, it means uh, luck. In some other cultures, it means passion. 
So how the students are looking into these and how these colors are represented in a particular image. Uh, one of the things that I've done this semester with my students, and I find that it extremely uplifts their motivation is to ask them to upload their materials on Padlet, where they could actually look into each other's work and you know, uh, comment and uh, have fun. And I find this is very uh, interesting because the students, when they know that they have to upload, they, they are more motivated to present uh, good work. And so in conclusion, English uh, language le learners benefit further from visuals as they may find clues in the pictures that help demystify the text and increase comprehension. It's all about the demystification of the text and text here is images, reading those images through proper structure could be easily adapted into other languages for all levels from toddlers right up to university students, you could easily adopt and adapt images. Uh, elicits various follow-up activities, role-playing, mind, poetry, which I've just shown as examples, uh, and storytelling. So yeah, uh, these are the recommendation of books that you could uh, uh, read up if you want to uh, know more about visual literacy, multimodality, the, anal uh, the analysis of uh, images. There are four books here. I call them, these are my uh, version of Bibles because they are so pertinent when you want to analyze images. And finally, before I end, I want to uh, leave all of y'all to ponder on this video, which actually goes on at the explore, uh, you know, further exploration. We looked into stills, but this is a moving image where you could actually stop at certain uh, scenes. Sometimes you picture me, I'm walking too far ahead, you're calling to me, I can't hear what you said, and you say, go slow, I fall behind. The second hand unwinds. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me. Time after time. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting. Time after time. We all want better for our kids. Time after time. Introducing a better chicken McNugget made with 100% white meat chicken and no artificial preservatives, flavors, or colors. that was a chicken nuggets advertisement when i first saw it i was just you know completely awed by the juxtaposition of you know what was so common in the 1980s the time you know the most uh you know, uh formative time of my life and, and then you know it's the current and finally you realize it's a mcdonald's advertisement <laughs> Yeah, so with that, yeah, art is, you know, the ability of what it gives to see and even further the responsibility of its power to make us look. It's, it's so beautiful to use images in the classroom. It's just that, you know, the layerings of meanings, there is a way to go around it. So if you have any questions, you could reach me at, you know, my email address, push at ipgkbm.edu.my. With that, thank you very much. Back to y'all, Liz. Oh, thank you so much. I was just giving you a, a, a shower of claps and I'm sure you're gonna get those from everyone in our in the room today. Thank you, Tusha. So many interesting points you raised here. Thank you, Liz. I think we have time for a question or two, Lynn. Yes, I'd like to start though, if that's okay, <laughs> just because yeah. I, I am, you I'm a huge a fan of Persephone. Every single thing that you mentioned, I'm a huge fan of. I love Persephilis. It's like one of my favorite graphic novels. But that's not what I'm asking about. 
Um, I'd like to know, so you, you mentioned a lot about using this when you're training teachers um, and getting teachers to apply this in the classroom. How do you go about getting teachers who are maybe 10 years into their career, 15 years into their career, uh, 25 years into their career? How do you go about getting us into, to use these things in the classroom? Uh, very good question, Lynn. But um, my, um, you know, I work more with my training teachers. But uh, during workshops, I have actually conducted even two workshops with uh, with Malta at different uh, phases uh, to actually share with them how to go about, uh, you know, deciphering and dissecting pictures. And I present at conferences quite often to share the ideas you know with the rest and and it's always amazing the feedback that you get because uh you know many find it very interesting to actually go on to the layers of how meanings are created in images yes that's a good question Lynn. <laughs> i think Thanks. melina has a good question too i can ask it out loud um, I was just wondering what your students find to be the most difficult part of your basic um, model. Not the training teachers, but the, the you know, the actual students. I, th I, I think um, one of the things that they find uh, d difficult is that um, to, to actually uh, come up with their own interpretations. So that is why it is very important for us to provide uh, scaffolding for them. At this level, what are the things that they are needed to do? So uh, sometimes even, you know, if you have a low proficient student, it's important to provide maybe certain words that you see in that image, and then they move on from there. So that is very important because different levels of students, even we as, as you know, teachers, we, we look at things differently. So uh, it's important that, uh, you know, we provide uh, proper guidance so that they could actually look like, you know, if you, even if you look at the background, there is, there is a need to actually point this is the background. You know, what kind of shots you are using? What can you see? So this would, this would actually tunnel them into the discussion. Yeah. I hope that answers your question, Melina. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, it um, seems seems to, to me that one of the things that you raise is how important selection of visuals is. The yeah. teacher has to be careful to select visuals that are going to be one relevant, like the lot. The lot uh, is so popular and well known all over Malaysia. I, I don't know, but how, what sort of advice do you give your trainees for selecting materials? I mean, you've talked about it a little bit, um, but sometimes we don't want to get in deeply. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we want to use like that wonderful dramatic reading from that student with her, with her poem. We want to use the audio and the visual together. So I don't know. I, I'd love to hear you talk about selection of materials. I think uh, to me, most of my selection of materials are also actually based on the themes that we have to teach. Sure. Based sure. on the syllabus, because um, you know you are bringing in other other ideas, other thoughts. So uh, I think many of us are tied with our syllabus. What are the themes? What are the topics? Like I know, for instance, there is uh, the topic world of self you know, world of self. So for mm. world of self, I bring these images where, you know, different uh, uh, interpretations of even the starry night, it actually goes back to the world of self, how you interpret that particular image, how, you know, relevant it is to actually elicit or evoke the emotions inside you. So how it you goes on beyond that, yeah. Yes, yes. How, how do you feel about asking students to bring their own visuals? Oh, I, I like that. I, I think that gives, that's where autonomy comes in, you know. Mm. Uh, 
and mm. and we should always be empathetic in our classrooms we are open to ideas i am not right all the time you bring in your ideas and we share it together that is why i love show and tell you know when you talk about show and tell oh show and tell is for younger kids no show no. and tell is for everyone you know even you can show and tell in front of your husband this is what i did you know i cooked this this goes into this <laughs> That's a that's a show and tell. Uh, Liz, I, I would like to share here that a uh, very interesting question coming up from Lynn and uh, Liz, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Tisha, because I do teach currently in this semester selection and design of resource materials for the Tissol classroom, and it's just awesome what you shared just now. And that I mean, they select digital and print media but uh, student uh, learner needs and uh, curriculum uh, syllabus requirement is the main two determining factors when you decide what you bring into the classroom. And uh, I also give talks to teachers who are very experienced and the lecturers from various universities and your ideas are just awesome. It's just going to go in from you to them. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tusha. You know, I am currently working with uh, teachers who are um, uh, having reluctant and struggling students like how you highlighted. And this idea of using images, I can see it really working well. And I hope to give your contact to these teachers so that if they are going to try it out, because I want them to do some action research so that yes. it gets them motivated in their classroom to teach these demotivated students here. Yeah? So once the teacher is motivated, automatically the students, if they just pass it, rub it on to the students, I would love to give them your contact. And yes. if they're going to try this idea, they might contact you. And I have a suggestion for you, Dr. Tusha. Please yes. write a book on this that you have come <laughs> up with. Yeah, I train teachers, but I would love to tell them, read up, Dr. Tusha, and you get this idea. That'd be so oh. fabulous. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Karthi. Thank you so much for the support. Yes, I do get sometimes called into schools to conduct trainings, and I do that. And that's like uh, uh, what Lynn asked earlier. That's how I share. Um, also, another interesting thing is that innovation um, my students, when I in, introduced them, they have come up with their own innovation. Like, for example, coming up with a doll with, with, with various uh, adjectives attached to it and how they could use that into the classroom. And that is also all about visual. Um, you know, uh, today I actually looked more into print media and I ended with that McDonald's advertisement because. Uh, you know, you can go on to digital uh, media. There's just so much to do. And it's us and how we go into, you know, exploring and exploiting. And our students nowadays, you just give them that, that you know, that twitch and they, they go on to solve. You yeah, know, yeah, I, yeah, it's true. That. Yes. Yeah. It's true. Ah. Oh. Food for thought. So many good ideas, Tusha. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. What a yeah. treat. And I learned, I, I really had a chance to reflect. Uh, I'm a teacher trainer my whole career, and I, I am thinking about how all the teachers everywhere in the world, they always want to talk about how do I use visuals? And you have evidence, you've, you've done your dissertation, you have research to back up your ideas, and it's a strong presentation. Thank you, Dr. Tusha, thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, TESOL International, the webinar series uh, committee for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I had so much of fun, thank you so much. Please come again. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're almost finished here tonight. We have uh, one quick announcement from Linda Chu, who will remind us of our next upcoming webinar. We're coming to the end of our webinar season, and we have two more webinars in June. Uh, Linda, over to you. So thank you, Liz, and thank you, Tusha, for that wonderful presentation. And I really enjoyed it because I also use a lot of visuals with students 
Um, but this was really delving deeper into how to do it and the meaning and the different ways you can do it. And it was just fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, so our next webinar is going to be on June the 5th, a Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern time with Mohammed Zuli. And uh, so please watch our Facebook page because I'm soon about to put an announcement with all of the details for uh, this next webinar coming up and also on the TESOL CPD site. So please join us for that. Okay. Yes, uh, Mohamed Zuli is in uh, North Africa, Middle East. So we moved from Malaysia to the Middle East for our next presentation. We love having speakers from around the world. Dr. Tusha, what a treat to meet you. I hope we meet again soon. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation today. Um, and on behalf of our whole team, I wanna thank everyone who's come today. We have a very enthusiastic group of, I think we have 15 or 20 people with us today. Thank you for coming. I know you could have been somewhere else and you came to us and we are so lucky that you did that. Thank you all. Have a lovely day, a lovely evening, wherever you are. And please join us for our next presentation uh, on June 5th. Bye for now. Bye. Bye bye, bye bye for you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, Dr. Tusha. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>